Thank you very much for your patience. I think it was the Halloween ghost which is interfering with our IT system, so our apologize, uh, apologies for that. Uh, while uh, it's being set up, uh, I'm going to introduce uh, Derek, and Derek Bruin is the department head of uh, agribusiness and ag economics uh, in our faculty. He's going to uh, introduce the speaker. And Derek was raised on a mixed irrigation farm, uh, not in Palm Springs, but in Purple Springs, Alberta. And I always like to hear about uh, whether uh, staff have Dutch connections. And uh, Derek says he has none, but there were lots of Dutch farmers around when he grew up. So I'm happy about that. Uh, he has a PhD from Pennsylvania State University in Agricultural, Environmental, and Regional Economics. Uh, he has a, a long track record. He has been the past president of the Canadian Ag Econ Society, and he also served as the director of the Manitoba Rural Adaptation Council. So with further ado, please welcome Derek. Thank you, folks. Thanks for coming to our Halloween edition of the faculty seminar. Uh, this is also a, a food systems research group seminar, so I have some members of the group. Thank you and welcome. Uh, the uh, faculty, sorry, the food systems research group is an umbrella <coughs> organization fostering the creation of multidisciplinary collaborative research to advance the theme of safe, healthy, just, and sustainable food systems. Uh, today's presenter is Dr. Ryan Cardwell. Ryan is an associate professor in the Department of Agribusiness and Agricultural Economics at the University of Manitoba. He's the president of the Canadian Council of the International Association of uh, Agricultural e Economists. That, that meant that this summer he was the local chair of the 30th and an, not annual, biannual, triannual. Tri <laughs> <laughs> so it's a long time ago that it started. Uh, International Conference of Agricultural Economists, which meant that he was in charge of about 1,200 economists and, uh, and their Congress for five days in July and August, and it was a really good show. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ryan's research focus is, is, is on international trade, international trade regulation and foreign aid, with a focus on food assistance. His research topics include the distri distributional effects of Canadian agricultural policies, the merging of aid agencies and departments of international trade, and the untying of food assistance from domestic procurement. In 2015, Ryan's work on the distributional effects of Canadian food policies with uh, Dr. Lolly and Dr. Zhang uh, was awarded the Vanderkamp Prize given by Canadian Economists Association for the best article in, Can in the Canadian Public Policy Journal. Today, Ryan will be discussing the evolution of Canada's International Food Assistance Policies. Please join me in welcoming Ryan. All right, thank you, Derek. Apologies for the delay. I, this is, I think, as good as we'll do on slides, but it, it should, should do the job. Um, so, smaller crowd today than my last one. I, I, I decided not to wear my flat jacket today. I'm hoping for a less hostile crowd today than at my last faculty seminar. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, a few things uh, in the context of Canadian food assistance policy. First, I'm going to give some background on food assistance, uh, just to provide some context. Then I'll talk about how Canadian policies have changed over the last 15-ish years. Uh, and then at the end, I'm going to present some results from some research that I'm working on uh, with Pascal, who's uh, my co-author in the Department of Economics at the University of Lethbridge. So uh, just, uh, I'm going to do a few slides, just a background, so you have an idea what food aid is. Uh, so just for context, I'm talking about international food assistance here. I'm not talking about local city-level food banks. I'm talking about food aid that crosses borders. Um, and food aid is broadly categorized into three groups. So emergency food aid is what people typically think of as food aid. So this is food that is delivered to recipients in times of emergency. So humanitarian crises natural disasters, civil conflicts in refugee camps, things like that. So when people hear food aid, this is usually what they are, are, are picturing. Uh, pro program food aid is a very different animal. So program food aid is food that is donated by a donor country to a recipient country government. The recipient country government then sells that food in their home market and uses the money for balance of payment support. So it's basically a balance of payment transfer of money to a recipient country government, but in the form of food. 
Okay, and project food aid is food aid that is targeted to a specific objective, so either uh, like a development objective. For example, it could be provided to an NGO that is using the food to sell and raise funds to build a school or uh, a, lunch, a school lunch feeding program, things like that. So those are sort of the three broad categories of food aid. And the amount of aid going into these categories has changed dramatically over the past few decades. Uh, so this graph, now I apologize in advance, a lot of these slides are going to look small, they're supposed to be taking up the whole screen. Um, I'll try and, and point out any, anything very small as I go along. Um, so I've got two lines on this graph. Um, this is going from 1988 to 2012 and on the vertical axis, axis is millions of metric tons. So the orange line is the addition, the summation of program aid and project aid. So you can see prior to about uh, 2002, most international food aid was, and that's almost all program aid by the way. So most food aid used to be of this program variety. Donor countries giving food to recipient country governments. They were selling it and using the funds as, as uh, general revenues. Okay, that has changed remarkably over the past decade or two. Um, and in fact, most countries no longer do program food aid at all, Canada included. We don't give any program food aid. All food aid coming out of Canada now, almost all, is emergency food aid. The blue line is, is emergency food aid, um, which is now really, for most donors, uh, the only game in town. Okay? But that's a huge change, and that has really changed the landscape um, on which we, we analyze and understand food aid policies. So there are three primary ways that food aid can be procured or purchased. Um, direct transfer aid refers to aid that is purchased in the donor country. And so this would be wheat purchased in Canada, perhaps processed in Canada, and then delivered to the recipient country. So bagged, put on a boat, sent to a recipient country. So that's direct transfer aid. Uh, food aid can also be bought locally, so in the recipient country government. So this, this definition of local is within the country borders but it might even be right in the market where the food aid program is taking place. Um, or it could be at a larger market in a city within the same country. Okay. And triangular or regional food aid is when the, the, the money is provided by a donor country, it's bought in say the Ukraine and then delivered to somewhere in North Africa. Okay, so that's triangular or, or local procurement. <coughs> okay, again, this has changed dramatically over, over the last 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, so this graph shows the vertical axis here is percent, the horizontal axis is years, um, and the orange line is the share of total all donors global food aid shipments that is direct transfer. So bought in the donor country, sh put on boats and shipped overseas. Okay, and that used to be almost everything. If we went back further it would be basically 100%. That's come way down and um, the share that has been procured locally and regionally has gone up and probably now exceeds it. I'll, I, I won't get into detail here, but you'll notice my graph stopped in 2012, and there's a reason for that related to the data collection that, that we can't fix right now. Um, if anyone's interested, I can talk about that after, but unfortunately we don't have data for these kinds of things past 2012. <coughs> so who are the main donors? Uh, well, the, the short story is there's the US and then there's everybody else. Right, so the US alone, donates more than every other country combined, multiplied by several times. Okay, uh, so the, again, the vertical axis here is, is millions of metric tons. The US averaging you know, in the two to three million metric ton range. I've just highlighted Canada there, the red bar. Uh, I've just grayed out the other ones. The, the gr other gray ones are sort of the big traditional historical food aid donors. But you can see the US just swamps everything, right? So you know, the policies of other countries matter are important and we'll, we'll talk about Canada. But really, the U.S. is the big player in the world of food aid, as they are in a lot of things. So the ways that food aid can be delivered, um, these pictures are not showing up very nicely. Again, I apologize. Um, In-kind food aid delivery is, again, usually what people typically envision when they think of food aid. So this is actual physical commodities being delivered to recipients. So, you know, those of you that were around in the 80s would have seen in, on TV the Ethiopian famine and you see all these images of big bags of grain being offloaded from trucks saying gift of the USA. Um, so that's actual physical commodities being provided to recipients. Um, the picture on the right is, is sort of a stylized picture of a WFP ration. So 
rations typically now are, are, are a little bit different than just a bag of grain. There's an effort to meet nutri specific nutritional requirements. So there'll be like an oil component and a carbohydrate component and a protein component and some micronutrients in a blended product. Um, but this is still what we call in-kind aid. So the recipients are getting food. Okay? In recent years, we've seen a huge increase in the use of cash transfers from food aid agencies. Okay, so this is a picture of a guy with a, with a preloaded credit card in his hand. You might see the MasterCard logo. So this is what we call cash transfers. And this can be done a number of ways. It's not typically a handful of cash. It's usually a preloaded credit card like this or an electronic transfer to a mobile phone. And then these can be used to buy at local shops. Okay? And vouchers is sort of another form of, of cash transfers. So this at the bottom is kind of like a coupon book that recipients receive and you tear out a voucher or a coupon, you can redeem it at participating shops who are then reimbursed by the implementing agency, usually the World Food Program. <coughs> okay, so we don't have great data on how the shares of in-kind versus cash and vouchers have changed. Uh, the WFP, which is really the big inter international uh, or intergovernmental food aid agency, a UN agency, uh, estimates that as of 2017, almost a third of all of their food aid programs are now cash-based. Okay, so a third of their recipients in their programs are no longer getting physical food rations. They're getting either cash, or credit cards, or electronic transfers, or vouchers. Okay, which has, again, really changed the landscape of food aid. So governance, um, I'm just going to spend a minute talking about this. So uh, there have been efforts to govern the way that food aid flows are traded between countries. And a lot of this is related to uh, historical ties between domestic donor country agricultural policies, which I'm going to get to in a few minutes. Uh, the most prominent of these agreements is the food, it's now called the Food Assistance Convention. Um, the food, it used to be called the Food Aid Convention. It was first f agreed to in 1967. Uh, at the time, the Kennedy Round, your, your, or the Kennedy Round GATT was agreed to. And the form it took at that time was basically an agreement among donor countries, pushed very much strongly by the US, to sort of share the burden of providing food aid. And the form that it took at the time was minimum volume commitments. So every member country would commit every year to provide at least X metric tons of cereal equivalent food aid. And at the time, almost all food aid was, was cereal grains. Uh, so the, it was updated over the years, changed a little bit, and commitments were changed every year. The most recent update to the old convention was in 1999, and these were the commitments at the time. Canada committed to provide at least, well, this is a floor, uh, 420,000 metric tons of wheat equivalent food aid each year. Okay, and you know, in some years that would be exceeded, in some years it was not met, and of course there were no consequences of not meeting your commitments here, it was a voluntary uh, agreement. So over the years, this lasted a long time, from 67 to, to 2012. Uh, but as I've described a little bit, the, the landscape of food aid changed a lot. So a lot of countries started using cash transfers. And a cash transfer would not uh, show up as counting towards your commitment under this old structure. And donor countries didn't like that. They wanted everything that they were doing to count towards their commitments. And the other issue is, th if they're making volume commitments and price goes up, they're facing price risk on buying whatever commodity happens to be in, in the food aid basket. And this really came to light in 2007 when cereal prices went through the roof and countries had their food assistance convention commitments and suddenly they became 50, 80 percent more expensive than had previously been the case. So through a long period of negotiations um, involving a lot of NGOs and some academics and um, there was a new food assistance convention in 2012. And it, the name changed from Food Aid Convention to Food Assistance Convention for a number of reasons, but it's, it's more than just cosmetic. Uh, and now, very small text again, uh, but the, the key change here is donor countries now commit in value instead of volume. So Canada now makes an annual commitment. These are the, the um, 2018 commitments. Um, Canada now commits to a minimum of $250 million towards food assistance activities. And there are a number of things that can count there, right? It can be buying the food, some transportation costs are allowable, allowable seeds, tools, there's, there's a list of, of allowable expenses. 
So this has really changed um, the, the face of the Food Assistance Convention. And one of the most important implications is now that price risk that I described is passed from donors to recipients. Right? So a donor can now meet their, their commitments on a monetary value, but it may result in a lot less food than was previously case, the case when they had a, val a, a volume commitment. Um, so this is, this is really the important governance structure for food aid in the world. Uh, the World Trade Organization, um, I don't want to talk too much about that here, other than to say it was fairly heavily debated between member countries in the mid-2000s. So, so this was sort of a debate between the US and the European Union. Uh, the European Union has a history of subsidizing cereal exports. The US didn't like that. So they were trying to clamp down on that. And the European Union said, well, you're sending food aid out and, and calling it food aid, but really it's a subsidized export. So they were, we actually got fairly close to having rules in the WTO agreement on food aid. So that would limit the circumstances under which food aid could be provided. Uh, that didn't happen. The WTO has sort of fallen apart and we don't have any rules. So really the only rules are, are under the Food Assistance Convention. <coughs> So let's get to tied aid. So tied aid refers to loans and grants. So the, the acronym we use is ODA, Official Development Assistance. So loans and grants that require procurement of goods and services, usually from the donor country. So an example would be Canada agrees to, the federal government agrees to donate a million dollars to reconstruction of say Haiti after a natural disaster on the condition that some or all of that money is spent on lumber from Canada or engineering services from Canada, right? So it's tied to procurement from the donor country, okay? Uh, the OECD, this is um, an intergovernmental think tank that monitors and reports on, on government policies, including agricultural policies and aid policies. So they published this report in 2001, sort of the touchstone report on, on untying aid. Um, and what they were arguing is that tying aid makes it inefficient, ineffective, and that aid should be untied. And, and they, they make this policy recommendation that all aid, with an asterisk which I'll get to, to LDC's least developed countries and highly indebted poor countries should be completely untied. Right? So we shouldn't attach these requirements to its expenditure. Though in that same report, as is typical of agriculture, you know, the sensitivities of agricultural policy filtered through to the writing of this, um, untying of food aid is quote, left up to members. So all other aid was, was subject to these recommendations except food aid because of the sensitivities attached to the, the political or the uh, agricultural policies in donor member countries. Okay, um, this is just a chart that shows the ratio of untied aid in different OECD countries. Again, you probably can't read this. Uh, Canada's the red line here. So basically all ODA, this is not just food aid, this is all ODA is untied from Canada. Uh, the US is the blue bar here, uh, just around 60%. The global average is high in north of 90% and then countries vary across. So Canada, pretty much all aid now is untied, okay? So let's talk about tied aid, specifically in the context of food aid. Uh, so why might we be interested in whether or not food aid is tied to domestic procurement? What, what might be the effect of untying? Well, first <coughs> is the cost of the aid. So, you know, as economists, we know that if you reduce the number of potential sellers, you basically are just reducing competition, the price will go up, okay? Um, so by limiting procurement to one country, and in some cases, one firm, which I'll talk about, um, you're necessarily reducing competition, price is sure to go up. And I'll show you a few examples of that. Uh, some countries also impose processing requirements. So it not only had to be bought in the donor country, it had to be processed. And some countries also impose shipping requirements. So the US has these uh, cargo preference restrictions so that food aid not only has to be bought, uh, processed in the US, but also shipped on US flagged vessels. Which, you know, some studies have tried to estimate what's the premium on shipping as a result of this. It's big, it's, you know, around 50% premium just on the shipping component, okay? So the timeliness, th this is fairly easy to, to understand. Um, you know, buying cereal grains in Vancouver and shipping them overseas is a lot slower than buying it in or near the recipient country. So a survey of US Title II um, food aid programs over a number of years done by the Congressional Research Service found an average of about five months 
for in-kind aid shipped from the U.S. compared to one and a half months for local and regional. So, you know, there's variance within that, but sensibly it takes a lot longer to get cereals from the U.S. to sub-Saharan Africa than from um, somewhere in North Africa or even within sub-Saharan Africa itself. <coughs> So cultural considerations. Uh, so most food aid organizations make very strong efforts. In fact, they go beyond that. They pretty much insist on providing what they call culturally appropriate food. So if we're providing food aid to the Philippines, you know, they're not accustomed to eating certain cereal commodities, right? But if the Canadian government requires that any food aid provided by the Food Grains Bank is bought in Canada, we don't grow rice here. So it becomes a problem. Right? There are ways you can um, deal with that, but it, it becomes a problem. Um, and it goes beyond just providing them what they want to eat, right? It's not just a matter of meeting their taste to be nice. Um, it becomes an issue of, of utilization of the calories. So I've just got a reference here to a study of, of some people who were, were uh, I don't think they were running an experiment, but they were studying uh, food aid provision in a refugee camp in Zaire, and they were being provided with maize, and what they observed were, were recipients who were certainly macronutrient deficient, they were calorie deficient, were selling their maize at very low cost because they didn't want to eat it, they didn't know what to do with it, and then they were buying other things. And so the response to that from people on the ground was, well, we can cut the rations because they're selling it. Right? So it, it really has serious policy implications of providing people what they're not accustomed to or, or know how to consume and prepare. <coughs> Local market effects, um, so you know, studying the effects on a local grain market of receiving a large food aid shipment, this was a big cottage industry among economists about 15 years ago, looking at what is the effect of a, of a big supply shock of getting a huge shipment of, say, wheat into a local market. The idea is that if you get this huge supply shock, you push local prices down, and it may reduce the incentive in the future for producers to grow this crop, right, because they face a lower price, which is certainly not what you want to do with food aid. Um, this is not as big a problem now. We don't do program food aid anymore. Most implementing agencies conduct market analyses before they start doing this. Um, but it was an issue, and, and some of the research actually helped to, to address this. Rent seeking. So rent seeking is, is a phrase used by social scientists to describe efforts to manipulate political outcomes, right, to capture rents in a market. So uh, tying food aid procurement to a single country creates lots of opportunities for rent seekers, right, to try and get in and manipulate the rules so that you can capture some of those rents. And I'm going to describe, talk about a few of those in the context of Canada. And then finally, the Tinbergen rule. This is, uh, Jan Tinbergen is a, a dead economist. Um, and the Tinbergen rule is basically that for each single policy objective you want to achieve, you need at least one policy tool. Okay, at least one, maybe two, three, four, ten. Uh, and the idea of trying to kill two birds with one stone when you're designing policy is almost always a bad idea, right? Because you'll do a bad job of both. And food aid is a classic textbook example of this, right? So what most donors used to do, and some still do, is take their ODA humanitarian budget and say, okay, well, let's spend some of that money to subsidize domestic farmers and subsidize domestic processors and win some political allies in strategic countries, and maybe we'll give some food to poor people, okay? And you basically just do a bad job of everything, right? Uh, you know, if you want to subsidize farmers, write them a check, right? Don't use your ODA budget to do this complicated string of, of things. Uh, so this is just something that I always try and get my students to at least have in their minds when they're thinking about analyzing policy. What's the objective? What, what tools should we be using to achieve that objective? Uh, so I'm just going to go through uh, a few examples of how aid is tied in different countries. Um, so there's a long link between, an historic link between domestic agricultural policies and food aid policies. And in, in a lot of ways, food aid can be understood to be an unintended consequence of domestic subsidies to farmers. Okay? So in the case of the U.S., most of the funding for U.S. international food aid programs comes not from USAID, it comes from the USDA through the Farm Bill. Okay? Uh, now historically, it, it's come from a number of sources. The, the, one of the very, very important sources for these commodities was public stocks held by the government in the US 
that were acquired through the loan rate program. Some of you, are, I'm sure, are familiar with the loan rate program, in which the U.S. government acquired huge stocks of, of cereal crops. And they needed something to do with it. Well, let's give it away. Okay? Um, the loan rate doesn't exist anymore, but during this period, this, in, this, this collection of interest groups developed. Said, well, this is great for our business interests. We can get in on this. And so um, this iron triangle, this, that's a phrase that Chris Barrett, he's a, a food aid scholar at Cornell, uh, describes this iron triangle of, of interest groups related to food aid policy in the U.S. that are, are keen to keep the tying restrictions as they are. So these are grain companies who benefit from non-competitive bids, um, shipping companies who benefit from these cargo preference restrictions, and then NGOs who, instead of getting cash from the government, they get food, they monetize the food, and then they use those funds to, to undertake their, their uh, programs. So that's, uh, and most food aid in the U.S. is still tied. So there are a number of different programs in the U.S. It's very complicated. Um, but most food aid by, by volume is tied in the U.S. Uh, the EU is, uh, has several different types of food aid programs. There's the official ECHO, European Commission, a humanitarian organization, and then a lot of member countries have their own bilateral programs. But uh, the history is very similar. Uh, it started out as an attempt to dispose of surplus commodities that were acquired through government subsidy programs for farmers. Okay. Um, originally tied, the European Commission untied food aid shipments in 1996, so quite a while ago. Japan, uh, not historically a, a big donor, but an interesting case. Uh, so Japan used to provide almost exclusively cash. Uh, and then in 1995, they signed the Uruguay Round Agreement on Agriculture in which they agreed to uh, import a specified minimum amount of rice into their country from other, other exporting countries. And interestingly, so they had like zero in-kind food aid shipments out of Japan. And then in 1995, suddenly we started seeing in-kind rice food aid shipments out of Japan. So I haven't seen a good study that's really traced the grain, but it seems what they were doing is they were meeting their minimum access commitments with imported rice, turning it around, and then shipping it out as food aid. So it wasn't actually getting into the market. Uh, so let's get to Canada. So Canadian food aid officially, government official food aid started in about 19, in 1951 with the Colombo Plan, <coughs> which was an effort to provide development and humanitarian assistance to South Asian countries. So this started, in, in the case of Canada, this started with in-kind food aid wheat shipments to India, and then expanded to Pakistan and Sri Lanka. And over the, the years after this, Canada started using this as a tool for surplus disposal. So in years in which carryover stocks were high, a lot of wheat was shipped out of Canada as in-kind food aid. Okay? And this became a tool that was used in, in, in every year uh, after this and more in years when these commodity prices were low and stocks were high. Okay, so of course, observing this, um, other industries could smell blood, right? They, they could see, well, if the government is willing to do this for cereal crops, why don't we get in on the game, start lobbying, and get them to add new requirements so that this food aid budget has to be spent on whatever it is we happen to be producing, okay, at non-competitive prices. So AAFC and the Treasury Board for many years actually not only required that it be bought in Canada, they actually dictated what commodities had to go into the food aid basket. So we started donating weird things like dried egg powder, skim milk powder, tinned fish, mackerel, and then my, my favorite Canadian beef loaf, um, which was an actual thing in a tin that Canada tried shipping as food aid. I mean, these are not the types of commodities that programmers at the WFP want as food aid, right? For a lot of reasons. People aren't accustomed to eating them. They're expensive to buy. They're expensive to ship. It's just, it's, it's not great policy. But this was the world that, that uh, developed as a result of this rent-seeking. And you know, these took on an industry flavor and a regional flavor, right? Fish, well, they don't grow a lot of grain in the East, but they wanted in on this, so let's get some fish in the food aid basket, okay? Uh, and this was, you know, pretty much formalized in a lot of government documents. This is just an example from a CETA document in 1978. Food aid must contribute to surplus disposal and increased value added, right? So this government fetishization of value added. We have value added. So, um, and there were, there were clear uh, explicit instructions. Any cereal, wheat, 
uh, or barley, there wasn't a lot of barley delivered, but had to be purchased from the wheat board. Any dairy products had to be purchased from the Dairy Commission. Any f mac tinned mackerel had to be purchased from the fisheries prices support board at whatever prices they posted. Okay? And this, this really forced CETA into position of, CETA is the Canadian International Development uh, Agency, doesn't exist anymore, but they were put in this defensive position every year of saying, okay, well, you're going to give us X million dollars, okay, let's plan our operations, and then we're told, well, actually, you've got to spend 800,000 of that on uh, Canadian beef loaf. So it really created this, I don't want to say antagonistic relationship, but it put them on the defensive, right? They were always trying to defend their budget to do what they thought they needed to do to, uh, to hand out food aid, <coughs> or to acquire food aid. And actually, another complication is, you know, it, millers, so the, the companies that were meeting these domestic milling restrictions, there weren't a lot of them, but there were more than one, they were actually uh, investigated and convicted of price fixing uh, for food aid. So, so CETA would put out these, uh, these requests for contracts on milled wheat, for example, and these milling companies agreed amongst each other to take turns bidding at a fixed price. So they were fixing prices. So this wasn't an issue for wheat and dairy because those prices are already fixed, right? Because there was only one place to buy it. But in the places where there actually might be a little competition, they were fixing prices and convicted. <coughs> um, th this is actually ahead uh, from the Free Press in 1990, I think. March 1990. Rigged flour prices um, alleged. Manitoba Millers, so it lists some of the companies that were investigated. So here's just a few anecdotal examples. So as I mentioned, you restrict the number of sellers, you reduce competition, prices go up. Um, CETA did a, a study in, in 2006 that looked at what they described as being overcharged by the wheat board. So they were comparing the price they paid to the prevailing world market price. Um, and by the way, anecdotally too, they, the Food Grains Bank tell, guys tell me that not only were they overpaying, they had to buy a higher grade of wheat than they otherwise would have needed. So uh, CDC overcharged, this was an audit, uh, Auditor General Report 84, CDC was overcharging, you know, how you define overcharging, but basically comparing it to a world price, okay? <clears throat> so, reform. So what's changed? Uh, well, I mean, not a lot for a very long time, right? We started Canadian food aid policies in the 50s. Nothing really changed until 2005. And that's kind of understandable, right? So the, the interest groups who would benefit from untying food aid don't have a voice in Canada. Right? So they're not paying for lobbyists in Ottawa. They don't vote. These are recipients of food aid and, and maybe some traders from whom food would be bought for triangular purchases. Uh, but the interest groups that have a stake in the current or the previous tying policies have a very strong voice, right? They vote and they spend a lot of money on lobbying and they're very effective lobbyists. Okay? So it wasn't actually until early 2000s when a, a domestic strong lobbying effort started and it was really spearheaded by the Canadian Food Grains Bank, uh, which is, for those of you that don't know, is headquartered on Portage here in Winnipeg. Um, so they started a lobbying effort in the form of bringing in experts and writing reports and, and lobbying MPs. Uh, and actually, this is when I first became aware and interested in this topic. During this campaign, um, the policy chief at the Food Grains Bank called my PhD supervisor, I was still a student, and was asking, well, can we talk about what might be the market effects for Canadian wheat farmers if it's untied? So that was sort of my introduction to this topic. I've kind of been thinking about this topic now for 14 years. Um, and you know, I, I, I've told some of you, I presented a version of this paper to the Food Grains Bank a couple of weeks ago. And, and when I was there, uh, Jim Cornelius, the, the CEO, he was telling me about some of his experiences with the industry lobby groups at the time. Um, the NFU, Pulse Canada, were strongly against untying. They were very happy with these uncompetitive uh, contracts they were getting. He, he described some of the unpleasant correspondence he would receive. Western Canadian wheat growers, CFA, were on board. Uh, CWB was described as agnostic, right? So they liked getting these premium prices but realized that the optics were not great. And it was, it's a drop in the bucket compared to the commercial market. So, the, and again, this was all in front of the backdrop of WTO negotiations where a lot of people were expecting new rules on food aid to come out of the WTO. It didn't happen, but we thought they might. So in 2005, the tying rate was cut to 50%. And prior to this, it, depending on the year, it was about 95% for cereals. So it went from about 95% to 50%. So this graph shows, that, so basically the government gave permission 
to the WFP and the Food Grains Bank. We'll give you money. You can spend half of it wherever you want. Half of it has to be spent in Canada. So this graph shows, I've just broken my pointer. This graph shows the share of food aid here, the blue line that was bought locally in Canada. So almost everything. And then the red line is the share that is bought locally and regionally of cereals. 2005, at near the, it was near the end of 2005, and I think the announcement was in December, the uh, regulation was changed, or the restriction was cut. Immediately, we saw donors react, right? Right within two years down to that 50%. So this constraint was like perfectly binding, completely binding. Um, they were obviously preferring to buy elsewhere, and they did, once given the flexibility. So in 2007, I, I described a little bit that food crisis, when cereal prices went up, people had trouble meeting their commitments. So what's an easy, not easy, politically easy, but a straightforward way to, to relax these budget constraints, they completely untied. Okay, so again, this was at the end of 2008. Tying requirements were completely eliminated. So government money can now be used to buy food wherever the implementing partner wants. Okay, and how did, did uh, implementing partners respond to that? completely change where they buy. So no food aid basically is bought in Canada anymore. Right? WFP is not interested in buying food here and shipping it to Sub-Saharan Africa. The Food Grains Bank, likewise. Okay? They buy it where it is in their best interest and the recipient's better, best interest to buy it. So those constraints were completely binding. So anytime a policy animal, analyst sees a diagram like this, it's like, wow, that's really something going on here. It's quite interesting. So, Oh, and so basically now the Canadian government provides cash. So they give the cash to the Food Grains Bank, a little bit. Most of it goes to WFP. A share goes to the Food Grains Bank. They spend it where they want, okay, on what they want, wi within some parameters. So the research question. So what I'm interested in is how did this untying policy affect Canadian food aid? And there are a number of dimensions over which it can be affected, nutritional, timeliness, etc. What I'm looking at is the quantity of food aid. So how did untying affect the quantity of emergency food aid that Canada provided? Okay. Um, <coughs> so this graph shows uh, sort of an aggregation of the data I used in my empirical model. Uh, I'll talk about my data in a minute, but I basically added up every bilateral emergency food aid shipment from Canada to all recipients from 88 to 2012, and that's that blue line, basically. Um, so we can say, well, in 2005, it was untied partially. Well, food aid kind of moved around. In 2008, it was completely untied. Food aid moved around, right? But of course, we can't attribute any of those observed changes to untying because what we need to know, or at least have an idea of, is what would have happened to that blue line had it not been untied, right? So we can observe this. What we can't observe is what would have happened had it remained tied. So we build a model, an econometric statistical model, that tells us, okay, well, given the kinds of things that determine how much food aid is given, this is, I've just made up this green line. This green line doesn't mean anything other than maybe if it had remained tied, it would have looked like this. Okay, so that's what we do in our research, is we try and understand what food aid shipments out of Canada would have looked like had it remained tied. Okay, and then the difference between those two is sort of the effect of the policy change. Right, so food aid shipments are this much higher than they would have been had it remained tied. So that's sort of what we're trying to do in our, in our um, empirical model. Okay. So I'm not going to talk about the econometrics at all other than to describe you. Basically, it's, it's a regression model um, in which we have a dependent variable, which is volume of food aid. Okay, and then on the right-hand side of our regression model, we've got determinants of emergency cereal food aid shipment from Canada. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and there are a number of uh, challenges that we, we faced in doing this. I'll just talk about two of the more interesting ones. Uh, one is, I, I showed you this diagram before that shows that program aid has just gone through to the floor basically. No one does this anymore. Right? So if we're running this model over all types of food aid, we've got this really big important trend in the background that all food aid shipments are going down. But that's unrelated to Canada's decision to untie food aid. That's a totally different story, right? And program food aid doesn't matter anymore. Um, and we don't want to misattribute um, a fallen food aid to an untying, right? So we are looking exclusively at emergency food aid 
partly to avoid that problem and also because emergency food aid is really all that matters now. We don't do any program food aid anymore. Um, another uh, challenge that we've, we've faced is that after untying, so prior to untying, Canada basically for cereals bought wheat. A little bit of maize, mostly wheat. Okay. After untying, implementing partners are buying whatever it is they think is needed in the recipient region. Okay. But that generates an empirical problem because if a program has a million dollars to spend and they used to be buying wheat with it, all else equal, they have a million dollars now and they're buying rice, the volume will be lower because rice is more expensive. So we need a way in our model to account for this. We don't want to attribute a change in the composition of the basket, which would show up as lower volumes, as a, an effect of untying. So we've got a way in our, our model to account for this. Uh, but basically, they're not buying less aid because it's untied. They're just able to buy what they actually wanted to buy. So we, we control for that in our model. This, so I guess I didn't explain that. The yellow line is, is the share of the Canadian emergency basket that's wheat, most of it, all in some years. The green line is rice come up after untying, blue is maize, which has come way up after untying. So we need to account for this, okay? Um, <clears throat> our data, uh, mo our most important data for this, the food aid data, um, is, it comes from the World Food Program. So I, I spent part of my sabbatical in Rome and, and I, where, where WFP is headquartered and after many trips out there, I finally got access to this transaction level data on every bilateral food aid shipment made and recorded in the WFP database. So this really granular data on shipment date, arrival date, quantity, where it was purchased, what it is, et cetera. So that's my, my main data set. Um, and this is basically what, what our dependent variable is. Emergency cereal food aid shipments out of Canada in what's called grain equivalent, just a way of, of adjusting these. So then we have the variables or the factors that explain how much food aid Canada ships. <coughs> So typical in these models is a sort of a donor capacity variable. There's a big literature on aid allocation and I'm kind of following in that. Um, so how much money does Canada provide in emergency humanitarian aid overall? So all emergency humanitarian ODA in a year. Okay, so the more aid that is budgeted for humanitarian aid, the more we would expect to be spent on food aid, all else equal. We then have a, a range of variables that, est or that, that measure how needy a recipient country is. So in the aid literature, the most common of these is GDP per capita. So the poorer our countries, the more aid they receive. And this variable is pretty good in the context of development aid, but we're looking at emergency aid, which is quite different. So we also need to account for instances where emergency aid is needed. So for that, we have measures of whether there was a violent conflict in a country or a region, and then how intense that violent conflict was. And then we have a measure of whether there was a natural disaster in that year, and then how intense that natural disaster was. And I'm going to use both forms of those variables, as I'll explain. Uh, we've got some bilateral ties between countries. We know that countries that trade with each other typically give more aid. Um, that's a, a very solid finding in empirical development economics. So we have exports from Canada to the recipient country in any given year, and the, and the geographic distance between donor and recipient. So this weighted price, I, I'm not going to get into how this variable is generated, but this is our attempt to control for the composition of the basket, changing from almost all wheat to some rice, some wheat, some maize. Okay. Uh, this variable is a, an interesting one to look at. This is, this is not the distance from Canada to the recipient. This is the distance that the food actually traveled. So if it's direct transfer, it is the distance from Canada to the recipient. But if it was bought in a neighboring country, it's the distance from the neighboring country to the recipient country. And so I've just broken this out by period. So prior to untying, the average distance traveled was about 7,400 kilometers. In the partial untying, that dropped to about 3,200 kilometers. And after untying, down to about 2,500 kilometers. So the distance of food aid paid for by Canada is now, now it's probably even less, but at this period was a third of what it used to be. So huge changes. Um, and then we've got these, what we call dummy variables, to, to account for these periods in which aid was untied. So these, these dummy variables pick up the effects, all else equal, of what the, uh, the policy change did to, to quantities of, of food aid. Okay, um, I've got my descriptive stats there that I, I don't want to get into, I sort of kind of grade them out. <coughs> so again, the way we do this is we've, uh, 
got an empirical model, a regression model. I'm just going to show you one table that I'm going to go through quickly and then show you a graph that I think is, is a little more helpful. Um, but the way we do this is we do this kind of model in two parts. So in the first part, we estimate what is the probability that any given recipient will receive aid, food aid from Canada in a given year. So for example, what's the probability uh, or what affects the probability of Haiti getting emergency cereal food aid from Canada in 2000? And then we estimate that over all these explanatory variables. So we find, I hope, yeah, I guess you can kind of read those, um, you know, fairly intuitive results. You know, the bigger is the aid budget, the more likely a recipient is to get aid, all else equal. The poorer is a country, the more likely they are to get aid, intuitive. If there is an outbreak of domestic, or I shouldn't say domestic, civil violence within the recipient region, more likely to get aid. If there is a natural disaster, more likely to get aid, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? Um, interestingly, so these are our untying variables. So this is our attempt to pick up what is the effect of that policy change on the likelihood of getting aid in any given year. And this is telling us that untying had no effect, partial untying had no effect on Canada's selection of aid recipients, and neither did full untying. So as a result of untying, the WFP didn't suddenly decide to give aid to more countries, or less countries, or fewer countries. Okay, we're not, we're not observing that. The next part of this two-part model is to estimate, okay, given that you are receiving aid, you've been selected as an aid recipient, how, are these fact, how do these factors affect how much aid you receive? Okay, so again, most of the results are sort of a, a bit our, our priors, our expectations. Um, this one is, I'm actually not going to talk about, there's an interesting story on this negative one that I think I definitely don't have time to talk about. Um, we're finding, you know, the more intense is violence, the more aid you get, similar story, trading ties, important and, and positively significant. Then we get to our interesting variables, our untying variables. So again, we're finding untying food aid in the case of Canada, in this version of the model, did not increase the volume of food aid delivered to recipients. But what we haven't done yet in this version of the model is controlled for some of these things I had on the last slide, specifically the change in the commodity basket, right? So I'm not accounting here for the fact that the, the donors or the, the implementing partners are now buying more expensive commodities. And that is showing up as no result, right? So the next version I'll show you, I'm not going to go through everything, but I just want to highlight these last two numbers, is that once we start controlling for these other factors, we are finding a very positive, very significant, and very robust result of untying on food aid shipments. So not on choice of, of recipients, but on volume once you've been selected. Okay? So to put all that in a really simple, too simple graph, um, I mean, again, the idea is to build this credible counterfactual model. It says, here's what we observed. What would we obs have observed had that policy not changed? Now, there's a lot of assumptions and caveats to a diagram like this, especially in a two-part model. But I've showed you this diagram before. This is what we actually observed in the data. Then we can take the parameters from our model, say, well, what would have happened if it hadn't been untied? Okay, with those dummy variables at the end. And so our counterfactual for partial untying tells us that, well, had aid not been partially or 50% untied in 2005, Canadian emergency cereal shipments would have looked something like that. Okay, so the distance between the blue line and the orange line here, we could describe as the policy treatment effect of untying aid over that period. Okay, and then in 2008, it was completely untied. So we can use our model then to simulate what aid might have looked like in Canada had, had it um, not been untied. And this is what we get. So this is partial untying, full untying. So this is what our model tells us aid would have looked like had it not been untied at all, compared to what it actually did. So we can sort of view the difference between the blue and the orange line as the policy treatment effect here. Okay. We've also got, had it remained 50% tied, you know, it would have looked like this and then like that. Okay. So we're finding very statistically significant and robust results, and these are very economically significant too. These are big effects. Okay. So discussion, I'll wrap up. Um, we certainly find that untying increased Canadian food assistance volumes, and I'm comfortable saying it was a causal effect here given the, 
the way that the policy was changed. Um, very significant statistically and economically. It was a, it was a big change. Uh, and you know, the, the effects that we are finding probably understate the real effects on recipients given the changes that have occurred since my data series ends. So as we move towards cash and vouchers, you're reducing even more of those transaction costs and shipment costs. Right? So as we provide cash, it's, it's perhaps even more efficient in some cases. So we'll call this a low end uh, bound. Um, so the question is, you know, th this has been of interest to food aid practitioners in Canada. Um, but of course, we're also interested in can this inform the US debate, which is sort of constantly going on now. You can watch these, these uh, congressional hearings in which shipping industry representatives are testifying at Congress about why tying requirements need to stay in place. And it's just, it's just cringe inducing watching this happen. Um, you know, can these results inform the US? Maybe. Um, but there's a lot of other things going on in the U.S. You know, one of the arguments made in the U.S. is that if, if cargo preference restrictions are removed and tying restrictions are removed, Congress will just cut the budget. And they'll cut the budget, the food aid budget enough that the food aid volumes won't actually be affected. So that's, that's very possibly the case. Um, and you know, the, the other thing that we, I wonder about related to some of my other work is, is are these results translatable to other kinds of ODA outside food aid. So Tide Aid is, is a, big, uh, a big issue outside just the world of food aid, which, you know, food aid is actually a very, very small component of ODA in the world. In Canada alone, it's, you know, in the neighborhood of 2 or 3% of ODA. And in other countries, it's much smaller. So food aid is not a big deal. It, it's, oh, most of the action is in other forms of ODA. So I think that's my last slide. So with that, I will be happy to uh, take any questions. Oh, yeah. yeah. Nice. Thank you. All right, thank you. Are there any questions? So, scene is gone now. Who makes these food aid decisions in Canada? How does it get delivered? Is it all government, federal government? Well, it is officially, they're part of GAC now, and there's a food security group at GAC, Global Affairs Canada. So, so in 2013, CETA was merged with the Department of Foreign Affairs and then the government changed the name of the Department of Foreign Affairs to Global Affairs Canada, it's now GAC. So there's a food security group in GAC. So they are responsible for this portfolio. But as to your question, who makes the decisions, to the best of my understanding, nobody. You know, I've, I've met with these GAC guys in Ottawa and it, they, basically they, they admit this. They, I mean, they, there's a lot of turnover there. So there's no food aid specialist there. That there's no institutional knowledge. But they get a, an envelope of money. They give it to the, to the WFP. And they decide. So the, the places in which Canada does have a say is when they earmark aid that is given to the WFP. So it's earmarked to be used on a specific project in country X. But in terms of specific implementing decisions, no one at, at GAC or the Canadian government is involved in that. This is all federal government assistance, not NGO. This is, well, it, it could be NGOs if they are operating with government funds. So this, this would include Food Grains Bank because they get a five to one match of private donations up to $25 million. So th those shipments would be in this database. So another question somewhere. This was the same question. I, I, I have a quick question. On the Untied aid, uh, sorry, on the other ODA? Yeah. Like how much of it in Canada would be tied and what does that look like? None. In Canada, almost no aid is tied now. Even non-food ODA. So that the table I put up at the beginning, that's, um, that's all ODA, not, not just food aid. So that's... Yes. So that's all ODA. Well, of which food aid is a tiny bit. So you mentioned the uh, conviction of the Millers in Canada. So assuming that, and, and maybe you didn't study this at all, but, but does the method of delivery going to untied or that, would it affect the corruption in, in, in the receiving countries and maybe does it actually get to the, to the recipients, you know, the, the intended recipients? Like, so does, does one type of delivery affect that, you know, the ability to 
scam or, or that takes them off? You, you don't understand that? Yeah, so, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of elements to that question. I mean, they, in a lot of contexts, I hear a question like that is, is in the context of cash-based aid, in which recipients receive cash. But is that, you're actually referring more to triangular purchases? Well, whatever. So, I mean, we switched from, you know, actual delivering food from Canada, yeah. to, you know, to more of a cash buying it locally, whatever. So I'm mm -hmm. wondering if one form of delivery reduces the, maybe the ability for people to, to, to skim off the middle or, or do something to that. Would, would well, it more go to the recipients in the form we have now than versus some of the other Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And, and so what, I mean basically what the untying restrictions, the untying policy has done is it's given the WFP the freedom to buy it wherever they want. So they, and they've been audited and they shop around, right? So they find the best price they can within limits of getting the right time, the right quality, the right commodity. And, and the evidence is that the WFP is pretty price conscious. And, you know, there's people meeting these shipments when they arrive and ensuring it's the right quantity, meeting some quality restriction. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. And, and there's no, there's no prospect, there's very little prospect for collusion and, and price fixing when you're bidding from firms in different countries, different locations. Yeah, as donors and as Canadian, the rate the taxpayers, I think you want to know that your money's actually going to where it's intended rather than to yeah. somebody. Uh, rather than to Robin Hood for fixing prices, right. Mm -hmm. The question, what happened in 2020? Your data oh, so, the, the, the standard data set that people have used for food aid research for years is, is not, it comes from the same source, but it's not what I was using. It's this WFP interface, so International Food Information System. And so they used to maintain a database of quantity shipments that you could, uh, you could download off their website by commodity, donor, recipient, etc. cetera. Um, and in 2012, they undertook this big audit on whether or not they wanted to continue doing, actually, I guess it was 2011, continue doing this. WFP. WFP. And uh, actually, a lot of interface was paid for by Canada, the federal government. Um, and the decision was made to not support interface anymore for a lot of reasons. Uh, one of the most important, well, one, they didn't have the money anymore. Uh, another, perhaps more important reason, is that aid is just done in such a different way now that those kinds of numbers aren't as informative as they used to be. So if we give a preloaded credit card as part of a food aid project, of which is 30% of WFP operations now, we don't know what they're spending it on. And we don't know if they're consuming it, right? So we, can't, we can no longer collect any kind of reliable quantity-based information on that scale. So in 2012, they kind of made the decision, threw up their hands, as we, we can't do it. Um, you know, to do that would require all kinds of resources that they, they didn't have, and it just, it just wasn't manageable. So it's unfortunate because you can't even go to their website now and get historical data, uh, but the decision is somewhat understandable go, the way that food aid has gone. And a lot of these food aid convention commitments now are made, so some is in commodities, some is in um, cash-based transfers, some is in uh, seeds, right? So what does a bag of seeds tran translate into wheat equivalent of grain? No idea. Or farm tools, right? So it's it just become almost impossible to, to aggregate these kind of data anymore. One last question in the back. Yeah. Uh, so from the period of being uh, high to being on high, uh, I mean, food is a kind of development, right? Sorry, that last part I didn't hear. Then is uh, food aid a kind of draw from the economy? Is it a draw from the economy yeah. of Canada? Yeah. Well, it's, it's government money being spent on recipients outside of Canada. So I, I guess you could view that as a draw from the Canadian economy, but it's, it's an expenditure item that the federal government makes on, on ODA. I mean, it's, it's tiny. Yeah, so I'm now saying if it's moving from the to the Yep. Yeah, uh, which means uh, there is no longer something spent, uh, money is no longer spent into Canada. Oh, okay, yeah, so... What's the effect of that on uh, Canada? Well, so there would be a very small group of processors that used to benefit from inflated prices because they fixed the price, they no longer get that inflated price. So they've lost a little bit of premium business. Um, the wheat board doesn't exist anymore, so it's hard to say the difference there. Uh, I mean, the, the, the quantity of food aid on the commercial 
export market in Canada or in a almost any country is so small that it's, other than this very small group, like in the US, there's a very small group of shipping companies that benefit from these tying restrictions, but each one of them benefit by an, a large enough amount that they spend a lot of money on lobbying, right? But taken as a whole, it's a tiny, tiny drop in the bucket. Thank you very much. Uh, All right, thank you.